All right, in this session, we're going to be talking about timing diagrams. A UML timing diagram is a type of diagram used in software engineering to illustrate the timing interactions between objects in a system over a certain period of time. They emphasize the temporal relationships between events or message exchange among objects. Timing diagrams show the timing constraints, delays, and synchronization points within a system. A timing diagram is just another type of sequence diagram, and we'll show you that in a moment. There's multiple ways to show interactions in sequence diagrams versus timing diagrams. Sequence diagrams focus on depicting the sequence of interactions between objects or components in a system. They show the messages between objects over time, indicating the order in which the interactions occur. Sequence diagrams are excellent for illustrating the dynamic behavior of a system, including the flow of control and communication between objects. Timing diagrams are particularly useful for modeling real-time systems or scenarios where timing is critical, helping to ensure that the system functions correctly within the specific time bounds. A lot of times during design discussions, I will use a sequence diagram with objects either based on the code classes that we might have available to us or simple model view controller design patterns where we're using views, controllers, and data entities to act as lifelines within our sequence diagrams. Now, what I will do when we're having conversations, uh, especially in Sparks, is I might use the constraint expression to represent timing constraints, non-functional requirements, performance objectives. So in this particular case, I'm stating that this particular invocation needs to, to get to the ML API, in this case, within 15 milliseconds. And then the, this API has 60 milliseconds, less than or equal to 60 milliseconds in order to process to the cache store where the machine learning AI is constantly training and processing and loading data for specific users, regions, or individual customers. Now, this use of the properties within a sequence diagram is not proper. I mean, this is, I'm just using these fields here to have a conversation. And so when it comes to timing events and, you know, looking at specific performance constraints, I will go to a timing diagram. So this is a timing diagram looking at the same sequence of events that the sequence diagram is looking at, or this sequence diagram is looking at. So I would tend to use a timing diagram to have a collaboration with other architects, developers, and stakeholders. All right, so let's go ahead and create a timing diagram. I'm gonna do it in our topics namespace here. I'm gonna select using the browser icon here, new package, and we're gonna call this uh, timing discussion. Not really too long, but that's okay. And we're gonna create a diagram in this package, right? So then this dialog pops up and we can choose structural, behavioral, extended, or anything else within Sparks. A timing diagram is a behavioral diagram in UML. You can see sequence diagram and we can see timing. And Sparks tells you what each one of the diagrams are. And we're gonna hit okay. So now we have a timing diagram. Let's go ahead and launch it. And we get all of the tools in the toolbox for timing diagrams. Now we're gonna focus on value lifeline and state lifeline in this episode. I'm not gonna get into these other tools. Well, let's just focus here. So the first thing when we start with is a value type line. You don't have to go right to state and start defining those. We're gonna drag and drop a value timeline in here and let's make it a little wider, fit the screen. And you can see within this that we have a value timeline, it's called timeline one. We can left click on it and we can name it right here 
or in properties, if we select this, we can go here to general name and name in here. So we're gonna call this just experience, right? User experience, probably don't wanna to get too long. Keep your names as short as possible. And then what we're gonna do is we're going to define the time range here next. All right, to define the time range, you can either double click on this and it brings up set time range, or you can right click in the diagram anywhere in the white space and you get this pop-up menu. You can set time range right here. So your timeline range right here, we're gonna go ahead and left click and it brings up the same dialog box. In this case, you can see we've got a start time of zero units and an end time of 100 units. But we need to define, well, what are these units? Are they nanoseconds, milliseconds, seconds, weeks, months, years, whatever? These are going to be milliseconds and we're going to use the acronym MS to represent that, right? Don't suppress in timeline, and I'm gonna show you that in a moment. We're gonna hit okay. Then what you're gonna do is the, it's just getting this warning. It's just telling you that something might be out of range. No, we know exactly what we want, continue, yes. So you can see the time units is here within the time range, zero to 100, right? So let's say, for example, let's bring back up that dialog box. And the way to bring that dialog box, you can double click on this and you can see suppress, right? So we're gonna suppress the timeline, yes. Now the, that time range is not visible. Well, you can't get to it by double clicking the uh, value lifeline or the lifeline in this case. The only way to get to it is to right click within the diagram set diagram range, and then check this box off so it's not suppressed, and yes, and we get it back, all right? That's very important. A lot of modelers lose their time range, and they don't know how to fix it, adjust it if it's not available, so there you go. Now let's bring in some state lifelines. And so we're gonna bring the first one in, we're gonna drag it way up here and let go, watch what happens. It immediately pulls up and connects to the other lifeline within this timing diagram. And in this case, it's the value lifeline, which is pretty nice. And then you can drag and drop these anywhere you want, right? So it's named timeline one. And what we want to do is actually call this, in this particular use case, machine learning ML acronym API, right? And then we're just gonna click away from it or hit enter. And now we have named this value type line. We're gonna bring in another one. Just drag and drop it, let go. You'll notice that as soon as you let go, you're focused on editing the state. And in this particular case, we're gonna call this Offer AI, Artificial Intelligence. This is a data science group. Then we're gonna hit Enter, and it writes it to the database and shows up here, all right? Now you can size these just by mousing over this connector right here, move it up and you can size these anywhere you, any way and anywhere you want, right? You can make them wider, uh, horizontally, you can make them higher vertically, anything you want and you can do certainly the opposite. All right, so now we've got a workspace between our states uh, within this timing diagram. Now you can start in any lifeline that you wish. You might not have all of the stakeholders in the in the collaboration or on the a conference call or, or in a room. And you can start anywhere you want and start modeling your timing uh, within your project scope, right? So we're gonna start down here within the value lifeline and we're going to define, I'm gonna double click in here, this configure timeline dialog box pops up and we have two choices. We've got states and then we have transitions. Well, you really can't do transitions until you define your states. So we're going to define the states here in this particular case. Now, default is normally the first thing you see 
and we want to change the state name for this element and we're just going to call it input right and i mean i hit enter and you notice that hitting enter did not change the name it's like well what happened normally i hit enter it writes the database you have to make sure i'm going to go ahead and select it you have to make sure that you hit save all right it's just the way that Sparks works and what you have to do. Now I'm gonna hit OK, or I could have hit Enter, and it has changed this state reference horizontally within this value lifeline, All right? So we're gonna double click in here, bring back up configure timeline, and you can see that input is our first state. We wanna add a new state, and this state is going to be request. I'm going to hit save. I'm going to hit new and we're going to add another state and we could just put response. So request response. You could put has response or whatever is meaningful for the state name, right? So we're going to hit save, All right? So now we have our three states defined. Let's go in next into our transitions and lay these out. So when we're looking at our transitions, you have several fields here that you can populate. These are optional, right? So you can define the event within the transition, the duration constraint, and the time constraint. And we'll do these um, later in this session. So we're focused on transition time and transition two. So the first one that's here is transition time is zero and it's transition to input, right? But we're, we don't need to make any changes here. What we're going to do is hit new, and you can see that transition time incremented one unit, and in this case, it's millisecond, so one millisecond. But our transition time for, and then we select request, the maximum that they have is 15 milliseconds or 15 units. You're not gonna put MS in here. It's already defined within your time range, all right? You're gonna put 15 in here as the unit. So we're gonna hit save. Now, I'm gonna hit okay. You can see here that input transition 15 milliseconds to request, all right? We're gonna double click in here. We're gonna to go to transitions and we're gonna add another new one, right? So in this particular case, we're going to response, right? And response is going to have a maximum range of 75 units, in this case, milliseconds. And I'm gonna go ahead and, and add that in here. There's no event or any of these haven't been defined. No worries, I'm gonna hit okay. So you can see now, Input is 15 units, 15 milliseconds to request. Request is 60 milliseconds to the 75 millisecond marker for response. And then there's 25 milliseconds that are left. Now I'm calculating my head. You can come in here and you can further define these. We're gonna go ahead and double click in here. And you can come in here if you wish, and you can put, I'm gonna to go to transitions, we're gonna to go to input, and we wanna put a duration constraint per our agreement in design, or it could be non-functional requirements, et cetera. We're gonna put 15 milliseconds in here and hit save. And you can see as soon as we did that, it drew in the bounds or boundaries with input that there, this is 15 milliseconds. So in this particular case, if you're doing this, you do not need to have the time range. I recommend leaving the time range scale down at the bottom. And I also recommend not doing your duration constraints early in the uh, game. And I'm gonna show you why in just a moment. All right, we're gonna go to the next one, I'm gonna hit okay. We're gonna go to ML API uh, state lifeline. Double click in here, we bring up the configure timeline and we're gonna add some states. So the first one is default, and we wanna change this to offer pending, right? Then we're gonna hit save, we're gonna add new, and the next one is going to be 
offer response. I'm just going to put have offer, but we'll have offer within this timing. Again, name this state, anything you want. We're going to do this for this demo, right? Now I have the two states uh, defined. I can go to transitions and I see I have the two states. The first state that we entered was offer pending. And you can see that it is added for us with a zero transition time, transition to offer pending, and that's fine. We're gonna hit new, we're gonna select have offer, and we're gonna set a time here of 75 units. In this case, again, 75 milliseconds, and uh, we're gonna hit okay, uh, save, and then we're gonna hit okay. So you see now offer pending at the top runs along horizontally on this line. If I mouse over, I can see it. And then at the 75 unit milliseconds marker, it drops to uh, have offer, offer response, or whatever you name the state. Now, if you want to change the order vertically, you have these arrows. So what I'm going to do is move this down and pending offer. I want to run horizontally this way and then have offer within the API this way, all right? Let's go ahead and do offer AI next. So we're gonna double click on this, this dialog pops up, and we're going to define our states. So again, default is the first state that chose. We're gonna overwrite default, and we're gonna type in uh, get offer. And again, use any naming convention you want. We're just gonna do plain active voice, all right? So we're gonna put a new one in here, and this next one is going to be as offer, right? Hit save, we're gonna hit new, we're gonna add another one, analytics. We can call it machine learning, simply learning, uh, training data, whatever you want to name this state, we're just gonna simply put analytics, and I'm not gonna use advanced analytics because I wanna keep it short, right? So we're gonna hit save. So we're gonna hit okay and take a look at these. And you can see get offer has offer analytics, but nothing has been defined along the lifeline yet. Let's do that next. So we're gonna double click, open up the property, this dialog box, configure time. We have our three states. Uh, you can promote and demote your operations. If you want, we're gonna leave them as is, and we're gonna go to transitions. So the first one in the selection is get offer. It has a zero transition time and it transitions to get offer, and that's fine. We're gonna hit new, it incremented one unit, one millisecond, and let's go ahead and pick has offer, and what we're going to do is say, well, we're right now we're working with 15 units of time, 15 milliseconds. We're gonna go ahead and hit save. So you can see what happened when we did that was get offer runs along this line, and then at 15 units, it goes down to has offer. Let's double click and open up properties again, go to transitions, and we're going to add another new one. Now, if I select the one that I wanna start with, watch what happens when I hit new, it increments from 15 to 16 or one unit. And what we're doing is we are going to analytics and we're stating that the agreed upon maximum threshold is 75 units or 75 milliseconds. And we're gonna go ahead and hit save. Now let's hit okay again and take a look. So you can see get offer runs uh, horizontally this way and at 15 milliseconds drops down to has offer and then at 75 milliseconds goes into the state of analytics, machine learning, AI, all right? So this is a simple timing diagram with just the basics and this works just fine, except we have some other things we need to talk about. So what I wanna talk about, we talked about it earlier down here when we, I'm gonna double click in here, when we added a duration constraint, which is an alphanumeric character, it's just adding some more clarity to your timing diagram. So we added that one there. In this particular case, we're gonna open this one up. We're gonna to go to transitions. We may go to a particular transition, let's say has offer, and I'm just gonna move this down right here. And we wanna add an event. 
So we're gonna populate this. We're gonna populate it with user interface AI processes offer. Just put what the event is and what's taking place there. And we're gonna hit save. Now you can see as soon as we did that, it added the event to the base here. So let's pick uh, analysis and we can add an event here. And we're just gonna say process, um, uh, process offer, process service, whatever you want to call the event, let's go ahead and hit save, right? I'm gonna go ahead and hit okay. So we added that in there. So now you've added some event uh, names to the particular uh, elements. And you can do the same thing on the value lifeline. You have the same dialogue. We can go down here on input and we can give this an event name. And let's say we just called it request and we're gonna hit save. You can see it added it to this horizontal lifeline for input. And you could do the same with these other ones. That's not necessary. If you already got requests in here, you know this is request, but if the event has a particular name you want to reference other than request, it could be, you know, get or get offers, something like that, just to add more clarity. So in this particular case, we've added an event. In this particular case, we added a duration constraint. But it's not a good idea to do in the value lifeline duration constraints quite yet, and let's talk about that next. So you may be collaborating with a team, you've got the service development group that's writing this ML API or whatever the API is called, and then you have your data science group that's dealing with the analytics, the advanced analytics and everything that is populating the data source, the cache, for waiting for this particular request. And everyone is having a conversation and the data science group says, wait a minute, we're co-located with the service architecture in the same cloud environment and we don't need 60 milliseconds. We can actually do this in less than or equal to 25 milliseconds. So you're able to go down here and say, all right, we're gonna move this to 40 right here. And that is going to be the constraint that you have. Now this team here, down here, that's dealing with a service or down in the presentation layer that's dealing with the user experience says, we have some pre-processing to do uh, and we're gonna need more than 15 milliseconds. They may come in and add five seconds or add uh, to 25 milliseconds or 25 units of uh, measurement. And then there, this, therefore this team needs to respond and say, well, if you're gonna be adding that much time, we'll still commit to the less than or equal to 25 milliseconds, right? And then you've got all of this time that's left over where the API group is saying, well, wait a minute, we're not waiting to the 75 millisecond marker, unit marker, we're actually getting our response at the 50 millisecond marker, and that's what everyone would agree to. In this particular case, you're able to come down to your value type line, timeline and move this to whatever the agreed upon time was. And let's say it's 25. And then this group here is stating up, up here at the top is stating that, wait a minute, we can have the, res, the request response back within 50 milliseconds. So you can drag and drop these, or you can go in and of course transition um, you can change the time here. So we use the modeling approach, left click, hold, drag and drop to change these values. Well, the one thing that happened here in the unit of measurement, because we did this earlier, we have to make sure that we go in and say, this is now a maximum threshold of 25 milliseconds, right? We're gonna hit save and then it writes that in here. Then what you can do is you can come in again in transitions and the data science group is saying the duration constraint for the threshold is to also 25 milliseconds and we can hit save. And now you can start putting some stakes in the ground so you're not spending a lot of time. And you can do the same thing up here with these development groups. We'll double click in here, we'll go to transition time and we can say, hey, on this one, this group said they're constrained to a threshold of 25 milliseconds. 
then just go ahead and hit save. You can see it does the same thing here. It puts the duration constraint up to the top. Now this is redundant. You don't need to do that unless you're separating these lifelines and reusing them in other conversations. So I'll leave that up to you. Now I'm gonna, we're gonna start closing the video, but I have to state that we're using Sparks Enterprise Architect for a reason. And that is the ability to collect intelligence from the delivering teams. So it's very important that we use notes and put as much intelligence as possible under the elements as we're having conversations. Nothing's worse than coming into a work effort a week after the, the commitments, the discussion for leading to design and development, and no one recalls the commitments or the conversations that took place. So use the notes area of each one of these to its maximum. If you wanna write war and peace over here, that's fine, but ensure that you're working from the requirements because just like in any other diagram or model within Sparks, you can bring in your uh, requirements, I'm gonna bring them in as a link. You can bring them in here and draw realization, realization to specific elements. Now in this case, I'm gonna right click on here, advance reverse, because what we're stating is that this element right here, if we go to traceability, is realized by experience. So I'm gonna bring in another requirement here drag and drop and show you again. Um, and we're not gonna select either one of these. I'm just gonna hit cancel, a link, and let it go. And you can see it, it drew that one. We're gonna draw a realization on a particular element. And we can do that from anything. We're gonna say, this is realizing this requirement. So when you go to traceability, you're seeing that the API implements this requirement. In this case, experience implements this requirement. And again, the requirement's gonna be fully defined with a lot more intelligence up to and including possibly being uh, supported by scenarios we've talked about in this channel and much more, all right? So use this to its maximum for documenting and defining what's going on within your project. I hope this video was helpful for you. Please leave comments down below, good or bad, ask questions. A lot of people have trouble with timing diagrams. They're actually very simple to do, very powerful. They can be embedded as composite diagrams and other communications and things that you're working on, all the way from the beginning and ideation where you're just brainstorming, all the way through design and delivery. Very good to come back to post delivery as you're going through warranty periods and you're having performance tuning exercises, defects that are coming in and how you're gonna deal with them. So document your timing diagrams and use them coinciding with your sequence diagrams, which are dealing with your service level events that are taking place, sequence of events, very powerful. So again, thanks very much for watching and until the next time we talk, happy modeling.